Welcome to Chapter 2, Part 1, Spires and Gargoyles. Again, we are reading This Side of Paradise by Francis Scott Fitzgerald, and this is Quiet Classics with Master J. Spires and Gargoyles At first, Amory noticed only the wealth of sunshine creeping across the long green swords dancing on the lidded window panes and swimming around the tops of spires and towers and battlemented walls. Gradually, he realized that he was really walking up University Place, self-conscious about his suitcase, developing a new tendency to glare straight ahead when he passed anyone. Several times, he could have sworn that men turned to look at him critically, he wondered vaguely if there was something the matter with his clothes and wished he had shaved that morning on the train. He felt unnecessarily stiff and awkward among these white flanneled, bareheaded youths who must be juniors and seniors, judging by the savoir faire with which they strolled. He found that Twelve University Place was a large, dilapidated mansion, at present apparently uninhabited though he knew it housed usually a dozen freshmen. After a hurried skirmish with his landlady, he sallied out on a tour of exploration, but he had gone scarcely a block when he became horribly conscious that he must be the only man in town who was wearing a hat. He returned hurriedly to Twelve University, left his derby, and, emerging bareheaded, loitered down Nassau Street stopping to investigate a display of athletic photographs in a store window, including a large one of Allenby, the football captain, and next attracted by the sign Jigger Shop over a confectionery window. This sounded familiar, so he sauntered in and took a seat on a high stool. Chocolate Sunday, he told a colored person. Double chocolate jigger? Anything else? Why, yes. Bacon bun? Why, yes. He munched four of these, finding them of pleasing savor, and then consumed another double chocolate jigger before ease descended upon him. After a cursory inspection of the pillowcases, leather pennants, and Gibson girls that lined the walls, he left and continued along Nassau Street with his hands in his pockets. Gradually, he was learning to distinguish between upperclassmen and entering men, even though the freshman cap would not appear until the following Monday. Those who were too obviously, too nervously at home were freshmen, for as each train brought a new contingent, it was immediately absorbed in the hatless, white-shod, book-laden throng, whose function seemed to be to drift endlessly up and down the street, emitting great clouds of smoke from brand new pipes. By afternoon, Amory realized that now the newest arrivals were taking him for an upperclassman, and he tried conscientiously to look both pleasantly blasé and casually critical, which was as near as he could analyze the prevalent facial expression. At five o'clock, he felt the need of hearing his own voice, so he retreated to his house to see if anyone else had arrived. Having climbed the rickety stairs, he scrutinized his room resignedly, concluding that it was hopeless to attempt any more inspired decoration than class banners and tiger pictures. There was a tap at the door. Come in. A slim face with gray eyes and a humorous smile appeared in the doorway. Got a hammer? No, sorry. Maybe Mrs. Twelve, or whatever she goes by, has one. The stranger advanced into the room. You an inmate of this asylum? Amory nodded. Awful barn for the rent we pay. Amory had to agree that it was. I thought of the campus, he said. But they say there's so few freshmen that they're lost. Have to sit around and study for something to do. The gray-eyed man decided to introduce himself. My name's Holiday. Blaine's my name. They shook hands with the fashionable low swoop. Amory grinned. Where'd you prep? Andover. Where did you? 
St. Regis's. Oh, did you? I had a cousin there. They discussed the cousin thoroughly, and then Holiday announced that he was to meet his brother for dinner at six. Come along and have a bite with us. All right. At the Kenilworth, Amory met Byrne Holiday. He of the Grey Eyes was Carrie, and during a limpid meal of thin soup and anemic vegetables, they stared at the other freshmen, who sat either in small groups looking very ill at ease, or in large groups seeming very much at home. I hear Commons is pretty bad, said Amory. That's the rumor, but you've got to eat there, or pay anyways. Crime. Imposition. Oh, at Princeton you've got to swallow everything the first year. It's like a damned prep school. Amory agreed. A lot of pep, though, he insisted. I wouldn't have gone to Yale for a million. Me either. You going out for anything? inquired Amory of the elder brother. Not me. Byrne here is going out for the Prince, the Daily Princetonian, you know. Yes, I know. You going out for anything? Why, yes. I'm going to take a whack at freshman football. Play at St. Regis's? Some, admitted Amory depreciatingly. But I'm getting so damned thin. You're not thin. Well, I used to be stocky last fall. Oh. After supper, they attended the movies, where Amory was fascinated by the glib comments of a man in front of him, as well as by the wild yelling and shouting. Yo-ho! Oh, honey, baby, you're so big and strong, but oh, so gentle. Clinch! Oh, clinch! Kiss her! Kiss it, lady, quick! Oh! Ho, ho. A group began whistling by the sea, and the audience took it up noisily. This was followed by an indistinguishable song that included much stamping and then by an endless, incoherent dirge. Oh, ho, ho. she works in a jam factory, and that may be all right, but you can't fool me, for I know damn well that she don't make jam all night. Oh, ho, ho. as they pushed out, giving and receiving curious and personal glances, Amory decided that he liked the movies, wanted to enjoy them as the row of upperclassmen in front had enjoyed them, with their arms along the backs of the seats, their comments Gaelic and caustic, their attitude a mixture of critical wit and tolerant amusement. Want a Sunday? I mean, a jigger? asked Carrie. Sure. They suppered heavily and then, still sauntering, eased back to twelve. Wonderful night. It's a whiz. You men going to unpack? Guess so. Come on, Burn. Amory decided to sit for a while on the front steps, so he bade them good night. The great tapestries of trees had darkened to ghosts back at the last edge of twilight. The early moon had drenched the arches with pale blue and, weaving over the night, in and out of the gossamer rifts of moon swept a song a song with more than a hint of sadness, infinitely transient, infinitely regretful. He remembered that an alumnus of the 90s had told him of one of Booth Tarkington's amusements, standing in mid-campus in the small hours and singing tenor songs to the stars, arousing mingled emotions in the couched undergraduates according to the sentiment of their moods. Now, Far down the shadowy line of University Place, a white-clad phalanx broke the gloom, and marching figures, white-shirted, white-trousered, swung rhythmically up the street with linked arms and heads thrown back. Going back, going back, going back to Nassau Hall, going back, going back to the best old place of all, going back, going back from all this earthly ball, we'll clear the track as we go back, going back to Nassau Hall. Amory closed his eyes as the ghostly procession drew near. The song soared so high that all dropped out except the tenors, who bore the melody triumphantly past the danger point and relinquished it to the fantastic chorus. Then Amory opened his eyes, half afraid that the sight might spoil the rich illusion of harmony. He sighed eagerly. There, at the head of the white platoon, marched Allenby, the football captain, 
slim and defiant, as if aware that this year the hopes of the college rested on him, that his hundred and sixty pounds were expected to dodge to victory through the heavy blue and crimson lines. Fascinated, Amory watched each rank of linked arms as it came abreast, the faces indistinct above the polo shirts, the voices blent in a paean of triumph. And then the procession passed through shadowy Campbell Arch, and the voices grew fainter as it wound eastward over the campus. The minutes passed, and Amory sat there quietly. He regretted the rule that would forbid freshmen to be outdoors after curfew, for he wanted to ramble through the shadowy scented lanes, where Witherspoon brooded like a dark mother over Wig and Cleo, her attic children where the black gothic snake of Little curled down to Kyler and Patton, these in turn flinging the mystery out over the placid slope rolling to the lake. Princeton of the daytime filtered slowly into his consciousness. Western Reunion, redolent of the 60s, 79 Hall, brick red and arrogant, Upper and Lower Pine, Aristocratic Elizabethan ladies not quite content to live among shopkeepers and, topping it all, climbing with clear blue aspiration the great dreaming spires of Holder and Cleveland Towers. From the first, he loved Princeton, its lazy beauty, its half-grasp significance, the wild moonlight revel of the rushes, the handsome, prosperous big-game crowds, and under it all the air of struggle that pervaded his class. From the day when, wild-eyed and exhausted, the jerseyed freshman sat in the gymnasium and elected someone from Hill School class president, a Lawrenceville celebrity vice president, a hockey star from St. Paul's secretary, up until the end of sophomore year it never ceased, that breathless social system, that worship seldom named, never really admitted, of the bogey big man. First it was schools, and Amory alone from St. Regis's watched the crowds form and widen and form again. St. Paul's, Hill, Pomfret, eating at tacitly reserved tables and commons, dressing in their own corners of the gymnasium, and drawing unconsciously about them a barrier of the slightly less important but socially ambitious to protect them from the friendly rather puzzled high school element. From the moment he realized this, Amory resented social barriers as artificial distinctions made by the strong to bolster up their weak retainers and keep out the almost strong. Having decided to be one of the gods of the class, he reported for freshman football practice, but in the second week, playing quarterback, already paragraphed in the corners of the Princetonian, he wrenched his knee seriously enough to put him out for the rest of the season. This forced him to retire and consider the situation. Twelve Unive housed a dozen miscellaneous question marks. There were three or four inconspicuous and quite startled boys from Lawrenceville, two amateur wild men from New York private school. Carrie Holiday christened them the plebeian drunks. A Jewish youth, also from New York, and, as compensation for Amory, the two holidays to whom he took an instant fancy. The holidays were rumored twins, but really the dark-haired one, Carrie, was a year older than his blonde brother, Byrne. Carrie was tall, with humorous gray eyes and a sudden attractive smile. He became at once the mentor of the house, reaper of ears that grew too high, censor of conceit vendor of rare satirical humor. Amory spread the table of their future friendship with all his ideas of what college should and did mean. Carrie, not inclined as yet to take things seriously, chided him gently for being curious at this inopportune time about the intricacies of the social system, but liked him and was both interested and amused. Burn, fair-haired, silent, and intent, appeared in the house only as a busy apparition, gliding in quietly at night and off again in the early morning to get up his work in the library. He was out for the Princetonian, competing furiously against forty others for the coveted first place. 
In December, he came down with diphtheria, and someone else won the competition. But, returning to college in February, he dauntlessly went after the prize again. Necessarily, Amory's acquaintance with him was in the way of three-minute chats, walking to and from lectures, so he failed to penetrate Burns' one absorbing interest and find what lay beneath it. Amory was far from contented. He missed the place he had won at St. Regis's, the being known and admired, yet Princeton stimulated him, and there were many things ahead calculated to arouse the Machiavelli latent in him, could he but insert a wedge. The upper-class clubs, concerning which he had pumped a reluctant graduate during the previous summer, excited his curiosity. Ivy, detached and breathlessly aristocratic. Cottage, an impressive melange of brilliant adventurers and well-dressed philanderers. Tiger Inn, broad-shouldered and athletic, vitalized by an honest elaboration of prep school standards. Cap and gown, anti-alcoholic, faintly religious, and politically powerful. Flamboyant colonial, literary quadrangle, and the dozen others, varying in age and position. Anything which brought an underclassman into too glaring a light was labeled with the damning brand of running it out. The movies thrived on caustic comments, but the men who made them were generally running it out. Talking of clubs was running it out. Standing for anything very strongly, as, for instance, drinking parties or teetotaling, was running it out. In short, being personally conspicuous was not tolerated, and the influential man was the non-committal man. Until at club elections in sophomore year, everyone should be sewed up in some bag for the rest of his college career. Amory found that writing for the Nassau Literary Magazine would get him nothing, but that being on the board of the Daily Princetonian would get anyone a good deal. His vague desire to do immortal acting with the English Dramatic Association faded out when he found that the most ingenious brains and talents were concentrated upon the Triangle Club, a musical comedy organization that every year took a great Christmas trip. In the meanwhile, feeling strangely alone and restless in commons, with new desires and ambitions stirring in his mind, he let the first term go by between an envy of the embryo successes and a puzzled fretting with Carrie as to why they were not accepted immediately among the elite of the class. Many afternoons they lounged in the windows of Trois Univers and watched the class pass to and from comments, noting satellites already attaching themselves to the more prominent, watching the lonely grind with his hurried step and downcast eye, envying the happy security of the big school groups. We're the damned middle class, that's what. He complained to Carrie one day as he lay stretched out on the sofa, consuming a family of Fatimas with contemplative precision. Well, why not? We came to Princeton so we could feel that way toward the small colleges. Have it on them, more self-confidence, dress better, cut a swath. Oh, it isn't that I mind the glittering case system, admitted Amory. I like having a bunch of hot cats on top. But gosh, Carrie, I've got to be one of them. But just now, Amory, you're only a sweaty bourgeois. Amory lay for a moment without speaking. I won't be long, he said finally. But I hate to get anywhere by working for it. I'll show the marks, don't you know? Honorable scars. Carrie craned his neck suddenly at the street. There's Long Duke if you want to see what he looks like, and Humber just behind. Amory rose dynamically and sought the windows. Oh, he said, scrutinizing these worthies. Humber looks like a knockout, but this long duke, he's the rugged type, isn't he? I distrust that sort. All diamonds look big in the rough. Well, said Carrie as the excitement subsided, you're a literary genius. It's up to you. I wonder, Amory paused, if I could be. I honestly think so sometimes. That sounds like the devil, and I wouldn't say it to anybody except you. Well, go ahead. Let your hair grow and write poems, like this guy Dinvillier in the lit. Amory reached lazily at a pile of magazines on the table. Read his latest effort? Never miss them. They're rare. 
Amory glanced through the issue. Hello, he said in surprise. He's a freshman, isn't he? Yeah. Listen to this. My God. A serving lady speaks. Black velvet trails its folds over the day. White tapers, prisoned in their silver frames, wave their thin flames like shadows in the wind. Pia, Pompia, come, come away. Now what the devil does that mean? It's a pantry scene. Her toes are stiffened like a stork's in flight. She's laid upon her bed on the white sheets, her hands pressed on her smooth bust like a saint. Bella Kunitsa, come into the light. My gosh, Carrie, what in hell is it all about? I swear, I don't get him at all, and I'm a literary bird myself. It's pretty tricky, said Carrie. Only you've got to think of hearses and stale milk when you read it. This isn't as pash as some of them. Amory tossed the magazine on the table. Well, he sighed, I sure am up in the air. I know I'm not a regular fellow, yet I loathe anybody else that isn't. I can't decide whether to cultivate my mind and be a great dramatist, or to thumb my nose at the golden treasury and be a Princeton slicker. Why decide? suggested Carrie. Better drift, like me. I'm going to sail into prominence on Burns coattails. I can't drift. I want to be interested. I want to pull strings, even for somebody else, or be a Princetonian chairman or triangle president. I want to be admired, Carrie. You're thinking too much about yourself. Amory sat up at this. No, I'm thinking about you too. We've got to get out and mix around the class right now, when it's fun to be a snob. I'd like to bring a sardine to the prom in June, for instance, but I wouldn't do it unless I could be damn debonair about it, introduce her to all the prize parlor snakes and the football captain, and all that simple stuff. Amory, said Carrie impatiently, you're just going around in a circle. If you want to be prominent, get out and try for something. If you don't, just take it easy. He yawned. Come on, let's let the smoke drift off. We'll go down and watch football practice. Amory gradually accepted this point of view, decided that next fall would inaugurate his career, and relinquished himself to watching Carrie extract joy from 12 Univi. They filled the Jewish youth's bed with lemon pie. They put out the gas all over the house every night by blowing into the jet in Amory's room, to the bewilderment of Mrs. Twelve and the local plumber. They set up the effects of the plebeian drunks, pictures, books, and furniture, in the bathroom, to the confusion of the pair, who hazily discovered the transposition on their return from a Trenton spree. They were disappointed beyond measure when the plebeian drunks decided to take it as a joke. They played Red Dog and Twenty One and Jackpot from dinner to dawn, and on the occasion of one man's birthday, persuaded him to buy sufficient champagne for a hilarious celebration. The donor of the party, having remained sober, Carrie and Amory accidentally dropped him down two flights of stairs and called, shamefaced and penitent, at the infirmary all the following week. Say, who are all these women? demanded Carrie one day, protesting at the size of Amory's mail. I've been looking at the postmarks lately. Farmington and Dobbs and Westover and Dana Hall. What's the idea? Amory grinned. All from the Twin Cities. He named the moth. There's Marilyn DeWitt. She's pretty. Got a car of her own, and that's damn convenient. There's Sally Weatherby. She's getting too fat. There's Myra St. Clair. She's an old thing. Easy to kiss if you like it. What line do you throw him? demanded Carrie. I've tried everything, and the Mad Wags aren't even afraid of me. You're the nice boy type, suggested Amory. That's just it. Mother always feels the girl is safe if she's with me. Honestly, it's annoying. If I start to hold somebody's hand, they laugh at me and let me, just as if it wasn't part of them. As soon as I get a hold of a hand, they sort of disconnect it from the rest of them. Sulk, suggested Amory. Tell them you're wild and have them reform you. Go home furious. Come back in half an hour. Startle him. Carrie shook his head. No chance. I wrote a St. Timothy girl a really loving letter last year. In one place, I got rattled and said, My God, how I love you. She took a nail scissors, clipped out the My God, and showed the rest of the letter all over school. 
doesn't work at all. I'm just good old Carrie and all that rot. Amory smiled and tried to picture himself as good old Amory. He failed completely. February dripped snow and rain. The cyclonic freshman mid-years passed, and life in Twelve Nive continued interesting, if not purposeful. Once a day, Amory indulged in a club sandwich, cornflakes, and julienne potatoes at Joe's, accompanied usually by Carrie or Alec Connage. The latter was a quiet, rather aloof slicker from Hotchkiss, who lived next door and shared the same enforced singleness as Amory, due to the fact that his entire class had gone to Yale. Joe's was unesthetic and faintly unsanitary, but a limitless charge account could be opened there, a convenience that Amory appreciated. His father had been experimenting with mining stocks and, in consequence, his allowance, while liberal, was not at all what he had expected. Joe's had the additional advantage of seclusion from curious upper-class eyes. So at four each afternoon, Amory, accompanied by friend or book, went up to experiment with his digestion. One day in March, finding that all the tables were occupied, he slipped into a chair opposite a freshman who bent intently over a book at the last table. They nodded briefly. For twenty minutes, Amory sat consuming bacon buns and reading Mrs. Warren's Profession. He had discovered Shaw quite by accident while browsing in the library during mid-years. The other freshman, also intent on his volume, Meanwhile, did away with a trio of chocolate malted milks. By and by, Amory's eyes wandered curiously to his fellow luncher's book. He spelled out the name and title upside down, Marpessa, by Stephen Phillips. This meant nothing to him, his metrical education having been confined to such Sunday classics as Come Into the Garden Mod and what morsels of Shakespeare and Milton had been recently forced upon him. Moved to address his vis-a-vis, -vis, he simulated interest in his book for a moment, and then exclaimed aloud as if involuntarily, Ha! Huh, great stuff! The other freshman looked up, and Amory registered artificial embarrassment. Are you referring to your bacon buns? His cracked, kindly voice went well with the large spectacles and the impression of a voluminous keenness that he gave. No, Amory answered. I was referring to Bernard Shaw. He turned his book around in explanation. I've never read any Shaw. I've always meant to. The boy paused and then continued. Did you ever read Stephen Phillips? Or do you like poetry? Yes, indeed, Amory affirmed eagerly. I've never read much of Phillips, though. He had never heard of any Phillips except the late David Graham. It's pretty fair, I think. Of course, he's a Victorian. They sallied into a discussion of poetry, in the course of which they introduced themselves, and Amory's companion proved to be none other than that awful highbrow, Thomas Park Dinvilliers, who signed the passionate love poems in the lit. He was perhaps nineteen, with stooped shoulders, pale blue eyes, and, as Amory could tell from his general appearance, without much conception of social competition at such phenomena of absorbing interest. Still, he liked books, and it seemed forever since Amory had met anyone who did. If only that St. Paul's crowd at the next table would not mistake him for a bird, too. He would enjoy the encounter tremendously. They didn't seem to be noticing, so he let himself go. Discussed books by the dozens, books he had read, read about, books he had never heard of, rattling off lists of titles with the facility of a Brentano's clerk. Dinvilliers was partially taken in and wholly delighted. In a good-natured way, he had almost decided that Princeton was one part deadly Philistines and one part deadly grinds, and to a person who could mention Keats without stammering, yet evidently washed his hands, was rather a treat. Ever read any Oscar Wilde? he asked. No. Who wrote it? It's a man, don't you know? Oh, surely. A faint chord was struck in Amory's memory. Wasn't the cosmic opera Patience written about him? Yes, that's the fella. I've just finished a book of his, The Picture of Dorian Gray, and I certainly wish you'd read it. You'd like it. You can borrow it if you want to. Why, I'd like it a lot. Thanks. Don't you want to come up to the room? I've got a few other books. Amory hesitated glanced at the St. Paul's group, 
One of them was the magnificent, exquisite Humbird, and he considered how determinate the addition of this friend would be. He never got to the stage of making them and getting rid of them. He was not hard enough for that. So he measured Thomas Park d'Invilliers' undoubted attractions and value against the menace of cold eyes behind tortoise-rimmed spectacles that he fancied glared from the next table. Yes, I'll go. So he found Dorian Gray and the mystic and somber Dolores and the belle dame sans merci. For a month was keen on not else. The world became pale and interesting, and he tried hard to look at Princeton through the satiated eyes of Oscar Wilde and Swinburne, or Fingal O'Flaherty and Algernon Charles, as he called them, in precious jest. He read enormously every night. Shaw, Chesterton, Barry, Pinero, Yeats, Singe, Ernest Dowson, Arthur Simons, Keats, Suderman, Robert Hugh Benson, the Savoy Operas, just a heterogeneous mixture, for he suddenly discovered that he had read nothing for years. Tom Dinvilliers became at first an occasion rather than a friend. Amory saw him about once a week, and together they gilded the ceiling of Tom's room and decorated the walls with imitation tapestry, bought at an auction, tall candlesticks and figured curtains. Amory liked him for being clever and literary, without effeminacy or affectation. In fact, Amory did most of the strutting, and tried painfully to make every remark an epigram, than which, if one is content with ostensible epigrams, there are many feats harder. Twelve Unive was amused. Carrie read Dorian Gray and simulated Lord Henry, following Amory about, addressing him as Dorian and pretending to encourage him in wicked fancies and attenuated tendencies to ennui. When he carried it into commons, to the amazement of the others at table, Amory became furiously embarrassed, and after that made epigrams only before Dinvilliers or a convenient mirror. One day, Tom and Amory tried reciting their own and Lord Dunsany's poems to the music of Carey's graphophone. Chant, cried Tom. Don't recite. Chant. Amory, who was performing, looked annoyed and claimed that he needed a record with less piano in it. Carrie thereupon rolled on the floor with stifled laughter. Put on hearts and flowers, he howled. Oh, my lord, I'm going to cast a kitten. Shut off the damn graphophone, Amory cried, rather red in the face. I'm not giving an exhibition. In the meanwhile, Amory delicately kept trying to awaken a sense of the social system in Denvilliers for he knew that this poet was really more conventional than he, and needed merely watered hair, a smaller range of conversation, and a darker brown hat to become quite regular. But the liturgy of living stone collars and dark ties fell on heedless ears. In fact, Denvilliers faintly resented his efforts, so Amory confined himself to calls once a week, and brought him occasionally to twelve when he vey. This caused mild titters among the other freshmen, who called them Dr. Johnson and Boswell. Alec Connage, another frequent visitor, liked him in a vague way, but was afraid of him as a highbrow. Carey, who saw through his poetic patter to the solid, almost respectable depths within, was immensely amused and would have him recite poetry by the hour, while he lay with closed eyes on Amory's sofa and listened. Asleep or waking is it, for her neck, kissed over clothes, wears yet a purple speck, wherein the pained blood filters and goes out, soft and stung softly, fair for a fleck. That's good, Carrie would say softly. It pleases the elder holiday. That's a great poet, I guess. Tom, delighted at an audience, would ramble through the poems and ballads until Carrie and Amory knew them almost as well as he. Amory took to writing poetry on spring afternoons in the gardens of the big estates near Princeton, while swans made effective atmosphere in the artificial pools and slow clouds sailed harmoniously above the willows. May came too soon, and suddenly, unable to bear walls, he wandered the campus at all hours through starlight and rain. All right, that's it for part one of chapter two, Spires and Gargoyles. Next part, 
a damp symbolic interlude on page 51. Thanks again for stopping by for more of This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald, one of my favorite books, and I hope you're enjoying it too. I hope you come back for more. As always, this has been Quiet Classics, and I am Master Juche. <laughs>